I'm very glad to see you all this Friday evening, and those of you who want some serious material, you're going to have it. I am struggling every night what to include in a lecture and what to omit because uh, there is just so much in the history of how we got in our faith to where we are right now. And so we'll try to do our best to show today the process of how Christianity turned into Christendom. And as we talked earlier in our last meetings, Christianity, first and foremost, is the faith in Jesus. Do you know what it is on a screen? Well, somebody says it's upside down. Actually, it is not upside down. This is actually a correct. This is the right side up. Uh, this little figurine was found in Jerusalem uh, in, the, uh, f uh, uh, in the excavation of one of the second century building which was most likely used for a Christian gathering. And uh, this is to be believed as the first symbol of Christianity. And uh, I'll explain to you, because part of this symbol is used today, and of course this is not the cross, the cross is used in the cathedrals like this. But this one here, as you can see, this is a fish. And unfortunately, uh, what some of the, you know, there is a little bit of a incorrectness in all this imagery uh, because uh, of the trends and stuff to make out of here um, it was um, the, 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 the Star of David, which is a little bit of an anachronism. I will explain tomorrow how this sign came about. Uh, it came about in 14th century. Uh, but uh, if you look here, see the tail of the fish? And what is in here? That's a menorah. Uh, so, what's the fish? The fish is a Greek ichthus, which is the acronym for Isus Christus Uius Theos Sotera. That's, that's why uh, fish is the kind of hieroglyph for Jesus. Because that's the all the letters of the Greek word fish, ichthus, they represent the titles of Jesus. That's where the fish comes from. Um, as to the base, the menorah, and in the original, uh, the base of the menorah and the tail, they kind of touch here. They're connected. They make uh, like a rhombus uh, together, not crisscross. So this is kind of a modern trend. The originally it was there. So when you see it like this, and those who've seen these symbols, and uh, some people uh, wear them as a type of pendants, uh, when you see it like this, what is, besides the menorah, What's also uh, visually reminding you? Roots. Roots of the tree. And that's exactly how Paul in Romans 11 talks about the, uh, the olive tree as the branches who are 
grafted in and branches who are, which are cut off. So, from Christianity to Christendom, how do we get from faith to a system? And the key person is this beautiful lady. Let me introduce you the lady after whom our famous, beautiful volcano is called. Saint Helena, the empress, the mother of Constantine, and the mother, sorry for my typo, uh, of Christendom. Why? Well, let's take a look at this nice Greek face and what is she holding? She is holding the cross. Because of the legend, uh, she came, you know, according to the legend, and this is really becomes a, a, a key driving force in the new Christian Roman Empire. Uh, Saint Helen uh, or Helena, whatever you want to call her, uh, in Anglicized or uh, Greek size, whatever, uh, she made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Well, it was a Palestine. Um, it was kind of a rundown economically at this time. There were some Armenian Christians living in this area trying to reconstruct the events because uh, if you are aware, in 70 AD, Jerusalem was burned down. So nothing in Jerusalem was preserved that would be obvious that here Jesus was, there Jesus was. Nothing. So Armenians, they moved there, and they settled, and they uh, have their churches, uh, uh, meeting places. There were some uh, uh, descendants of Jewish Christians, if you remember those after 70 AD, actually during the siege of Jerusalem, they uh, left uh, on the uh, east uh, bank of Jordan River, and they stayed in the city of Pella. So they kind of settled down. And so this area was not a well-developed area. Uh, unlike uh, some uh, popular opinion, uh, uh, Jews live in uh, Palestine. Actually, uh, if you uh, go in back uh, if, uh, to remind you, uh, the land Palestine was given to it in 135 AD, 100 years after Jesus' uh, uh, death, after the Bar Kokhba rebellion by uh, Emperor Hadrian. Okay, so that's where the Palestine comes. We talked about this. So, Constantine basically presides over the eastern part of Roman Empire because what actually happens, Constantine does not live in Rome. Constantine moves eastward because uh, west is constantly bombarded by uh, Goths, Hans and all the barbarians. So all these Western provinces such as Gaul and Germania and even the Italy itself, they're no longer safe and, and Roman armies cannot fully control the areas. Uh, there is an uncontrollable influx of uh, barbarians, mainly Goths 
and Hans into the Western Empire. So Constantine establishes the new capital. There is a little town uh, on, the stra- on the shores of the Strait of Bosphorus, uh, was Greek name Byzantium. That town becomes Constantinople, a new capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, which is also called Byzantinian Empire. So Palestine is a part of the Byzantinian Empire. And so while economically the area is very run down and depressed, Christians and Jews live there. Jews mainly reside in Galilee. They have their schools. They are uh, in full steam working on the creation of the uh, tradition which is called Gemara. Later it became to be known as Palestinian Talmud. And so this is the time when Empress Helen comes in And she, again, I wish I would be able to know exactly what happened, but what Eusebius, whom we already met yesterday, uh, father of the church history, tells us that she found the Holy Cross on which our Lord Jesus was crucified. 200 years post factum. No, 300 years post factum. The Holy Cross on which Jesus was crucified. So, this is now the site of this Holy Cross has become a shrine. So, I showed you the inner side of the shrine, and this is the outer side, which is actually... Uh, a big uh, church complex. They built a basilica there, uh, uh, and it is interesting, the word basilica, that's where the uh, Christian worship happens. Do you know what basilica means? It comes from the Greek word basileus, meaning emperor. So basilica in the pagan Rome, was a shrine for emperor. Under Constantine, he gives basilicas to Christians. And now basilicas become the places for Christian worship. So Christ becomes that kind of a basileus, the emperor. See, Latin is emperor, Greek is basileus. And so Christ is no longer a king of kings, but Christ is the emperor of emperors. Nice. And so this basilica eventually becomes a famous place, which is still in the middle of Jerusalem today, as a church of the Holy Sepulchre, because that's where St. Helen was told, here, right here, that's the casket. That's where Jesus was buried, supposedly. And... You should see, I, I couldn't, uh, this, these pictures are fairly old. I took them 17 years ago. I've been there and come there all the time. There's a line of people, line of people, line of people to kiss this thing. Yeah. And of course, this stone, that's where Jesus was laid. And so, This is when St. Helen, she becomes now a saint, comes back to her son, and her son 
makes Palestine a holy land. So what does he do next? He deports all the Jews from the holy land. Now this is the land for Christians. This is the realm of Christians. So Christendom is the realm. And so this is what is beginning to happen. By 360, I don't recall the date exactly, I think 363 if I am correct, the Council of Laodicea makes a special edict for anyone who keeps Sabbath to be excommunicated. Anyone who remains on the Jewish side in Christianity is out. And so this is when those who remain faithful set out on their journey. This is the shores of Ireland. That was the land. The place was not a hospitable place for Christians. In fact, there are several remains of uh, what they call now monastic sites. This place is called Glendaloch. Let's see if I have more of this, yeah. This is called Glendaloch. Beautiful place. That was one of the areas where Christians lived since the fourth century. A new research done by Oxford University demonstrates that the local Celtic population of Ireland, known as Druids, was allowing those foreigners to live in the islands, British islands, mainly in Ireland. But it wasn't really receptive to the message of Christ because paganism was very, very rampant. And they did their best. They were converting people, but not at the pace which would be satisfactory or in any way, shape, and form comparable to those massive conversions of Christianity, to Christianity of all these uh, kings of Goths, kings of Germanic tribes and all this, because these people were not operating on the principles of Christendom. See, with the Constantine legalizing Christianity, the Christian missionaries received the mandate. When they operated in the frontiers of Roman Empire, they were operating on behalf of emperor and the bishop of Rome, who slowly, slowly, slowly was getting uh, into a special status. Though, often, more often than not, being opposed by the patriarch of Constantinople. Such a controversy is going to last for many centuries until 1054, the great schism between Eastern Orthodox 
and Roman Catholic Church, when both pope and patriarch uh, cursed each other with anathema. But this is tomorrow. But today, we're in beautiful forest of Ireland. And the challenges which the local Christians had. The recent research in Oxford University argues that Ireland, as well as Scotland, was the home for the lost Judea Christians. Because it was absolutely definite, based on what they found, that the Christians who lived in those monastic sites were not local. The majority were not local. So the only way how the uh, scholars think about this, they were the ones who basically had to flee the persecution of the mainstream Constantinople and Rome. Okay, but eventually uh, the Catholicism reached British Island. King Ethelbert, one of the Anglo-Saxon kings, was the first to convert to Christianity and the first to bring the Archbishop of Canterbury straight from Rome. And so the Irish and Scottish leaders of the church were, were called for a conversation. Why are you not so successful in converting those pagans? You got to be more creative and more flexible. Well, what kind of flexibility are they talking about? Oh, uh, think of this way. This is a very popular feast in the Roman Empire, Parenthalia. You know what it means? It's basically honoring the spirits of the dead parents and other ancestors. So this is the honor of ancestral spirits. Uh, you can see similar celebrations today in the remote sections of Papua New Guinea uh, Borneo, Madagascar, you understand what I'm talking about. The local population, as my good friend who goes there on a regular basis as a missionary, I really admire my friend Vasily. He has nothing to do with the Vasilios, but yeah, his name is Vasily. He was a uh, businessman, he was uh, from Transcarpathian Ukraine, moved to Prague, and finally when he gave his heart to the Lord, he decided to become a missionary. And so he prayed to God to send him to the hardest place in the world, and it was the heartland of Madagascar. <laughs> Maybe one day, I, he was here a couple months ago, maybe one day I'll bring his story, how he does it. But when he came first, he was shocked at the level of paganism he saw there and realized that it will take years and maybe many generations to help these people who keep this horrible things generations after generation after generation for centuries, you know, it will take a couple generations to get rid 
of this horrible satanic deception. What they do, and he witnessed this all the time, they have this uh, massive uh, event once in a while where they would eat hallucinogen mushrooms and they would go to the cemetery and they would dig out the graves of their loved ones, pull out, you know, the skulls of their grandparents and they would march with them and dance with them and then they would store them under their bed. This is what parentally is. This is what my friend sees in the heartland of Madagascar. This was 2,000 years, the heartland of Rome and all the way to the west. That's what paganism is in all of its quote-unquote beauty. And so we have some nice pictures. And so this was one of the reasons why this Druids, who were really vicious savages, that's how Romans called them, because Romans could not conquer them. That's why in the middle of Britain they built the wall, and what was south of the wall was Roman Britannia, and what was no north of the wall, which we know as Scotland, was the land of savages. They wouldn't venture into this. The Roman army couldn't cope with, with Celts there. And Celts were not receptive to Christianity, at all. So eventually we, we, we begin to have Patrick, Colombo, and all these people, and of course there is a story of who really St. Patrick was, but hopefully I'll be able to fit it into uh, tomorrow or Sunday. It's just so much material. I'm, I'm constantly praying what to include and what to omit just the time limitation, but uh, all these stories are wonderful. So, what did the Archbishop of Kentonbury suggest to do? He says, okay, they like this parentelia. How about turn this into a hallow mass? Hallow mass the celebration of all saints. You see? This is just one of the examples of the shortcuts that Christianity of Constantine era was using. We'll talk more about the shortcuts, but the result of these shortcuts we witness today in plentifulness. Next month, yeah, it's going to happen. Well, the major issue, why Christianity began to lose the grounds, as I was talking about this, was enormous influence of Hellenism. And the Hellenism in Christianity is clearly manifested by the number of heresies. These are only the, this is the official list of heresies one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, uh, four, fourteen, right? Which relates to the issue of doctrine of God. As you can imagine, all sorts of things. But 
the major two heresies which really determined the political situation uh, in the fifth century especially was Arianism against Sibelianism. Arius believed that Jesus wasn't God and that Holy Spirit was a kind of divine force. So Arius presented that the Father is God, Jesus is a kind of run lower. This is a, a hierarchical system. Today we have some uh, teachings within uh, different Christianity that reflect Arianism, such as uh, the teaching of or the doctrine of Jehovah Witnesses. So they, cannot, they didn't come to anything. They didn't discover anything new. They just had it, you know, it's, it's, all, it's always been in existence. Sibelianism is a more kind of an interesting animal. But these two really, you know, Arius and Sibelius, these, are, these two, they were at each other's throat because they were directly opposite. Sibelius believed that at first, meaning in the Old Testament, was God the Father. Then, on a short period of time, he turned into God the Son. And then after a crucifixion that followed ascension, he turned into uh, the uh, God, the Holy Spirit. So this was kind of a, a theory. If, if uh, Arius was about hierarchy, this was about modalism, monarchic modalism. First was the father, father is no more. Then the son, son is no more. Then the, the, the Holy Spirit. Well, as you can see, this uh, definitely been a very confusing time, very confusing time for Christianity. And uh, the consequences of these confusions were enormous. If you ask, again, like a serious theologians, even the priests uh, from both Catholic and Orthodox Church, they know where they are not going with the Bible. But as I explained to you, when you are in dialogue with them and you confront them with the argument, okay, this is what the Bible says and this is what the Bible says, they'll come up with an explanation. Oh, it was a difficult time. We couldn't go otherwise. So a typical excuse for introducing all these uh, hallow masses and other masses and Easter's and whatever was, well, we couldn't get through to those pagans. And Constantine wanted us to Christianize Europe quickly. In 982, a Russian prince, Vladimir, who, was, who reigned in Kiev, which was back then a capital of Kiev, Russia, after a long discussion with the uh, Muslim imam, with the rabbi, and with missionaries from Byzantine, and with Catholic missionaries, decided to accept um, 
to make Russia an Eastern Orthodox country and accept Byzantine faith. So what did he do? He went to Constantinople and, to the, and was baptized in St. Sophia uh, Cathedral. Uh, and then he came home and he makes an edict. Okay, on this day, anyone who is not going to come down to the Dnieper River and be baptized will become the enemy of the king and his head will be cut off. So that's how Russia became Christian. <laughs> it was a quick fix. <laughs> a hundred years ago, after the revolution, and this is actually exactly a hundred years and two months is gonna, be, yeah, actually in a month there will be a hundredth anniversary of a Bolshevik revolution in Russia, the opposite happened. Bolsheviks came, if anyone is a Christian now, you're the enemy of the state and you'll be shot. <laughs> and so this is how things happen in Russia. <laughs> okay? So this is one explanation why there is obvious deviation from scripture, which everybody see. These people, the Eastern Orthodox Catholic theologians, they're not just ignorant. They know what they're doing. They will tell you. We need to Christianize Europe. We need to pay for it. And this is the price we paid. The second explanation, and it's again, it was the price to pay was we needed to fight the heresies. There were so many heresies and which actually was very difficult for Constantine to manage because Constantine allowed Christianity, but he wanted to manage church. And with all these different teachings about the nature of God and nature of Jesus, he couldn't exhort his management and control. And so, well, before Constantine came into stage, in the uh, later second century, early uh, th uh, third century, there was this man. I want to introduce another personality here. Quintus Septimius Florets Tertullianus, known as Tertullian. Tertullian was an interesting figure. He was born in Carthage. Actually, he was, even though his name is very Roman, but his ethnicity, even if you can see here on this portrait, he is a Berber. It's interesting that today Berbers are those who live in Libya, and that's what Carthage was. It's Libya and Tunisia. So back then, it was the hometown of one of the famous uh, theologian, an apologist of Christian faith known as the founder of Western theology. He was seeing all these different Gnostic heresies and he was trying to come up uh, with the understanding of God. Uh, I wouldn't say that his understanding of God was incorrect. I'm not going to 
read the whole passage uh, to you. You can kind of glance through this and see his argument has two major shortcomings. When I read Tertullian, I hardly see any quotations from the Bible. In other words, this was the problem. Tertullian was trying to fight the opponents, mainly the Gnostic opponents, the Hellenist opponents, using their tools. And this is why I'm just showing it to you, but if you kind of, while I speak, you read, you'll discover it's very hard to read. That's why I'm not even trying to read it to you, because you'll get lost. <laughs> because this is, the, this, is, this is the style of philosophical discourse. But I have to say one thing. He did believe in one God. However, to explain the oneness of God to Greeks in a way that, well, you have God the Father, you have Jesus who is God, you have Holy Ghost who is God, he couldn't because, unfortunately, as we read uh, several lectures before 1 Corinthians, using the instrumentation, the tools, which is, Paul calls it, the wisdom of this world, is actually not very productive for Christian faith. Because, as Paul said, in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, I'll remind you, God chose, us, God chose the foolishness to conquer the world, not the wisdom to understand God. So here, in my personal opinion, Tertullian introduces the concept of three persons. This is why the term Trinity actually is uh, basically comes from this book. It comes uh, from, uh, it's basically attributed to the Tertullian. Uh, and the major contribution of Tertullian is introducing the Latin term persona. This is the problem. There is no term persona in the Bible. Bible does not use this term because the term persona in Latin means mask. So on the one hand, he says, yes, there is a one God, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, but then he turns around on the other side of his mouth and he speaks about God having three masks. So this is a weakness of Tertullian, although I have to say he probably did the best with what he was dealing with. It's the question whether or not should he or anybody else faithful to the Bible use the tools of Greek philosophy to argue with Greek philosophers who were tearing apart Christian faith left and right. Tertullian did his best but the term persona, unfortunately, opens the door. It is very, it becomes a specific way during the Council of Nicaea. See where Nicaea is? And that's the Constantinople. So 
Constantine likes the concept and approves it because all the creeds which come out of Nicene Council at 325, they're all approved by Constantine. So whoever does not follow the Nicene Creed is a heretic. So what immediately happens, we have the first split in the church. Before, it was very uh, disorganized. Tertullian would argue with uh, different uh, opponents, and this argument was uh, preserved to us through the books. Now, with Constantine, we have a specific rules of the councils which become the law of the land. And that's what turns Christianity into a Christendom. So, no matter how wrong, we don't have many uh, followers of Sabellius, but there were Goths who were a big, uh, they had a big army, basically, by 476, they sacked the Rome, and the Western Roman Empire ceased to exist. And so they were forced to be reckoned with. But they were Aryans. So if you look at the map of Roman Empire at this time, Iberian Peninsula, which is uh, completely, uh, it's to modern Spain. It was ruled by uh, w West Goths. It was Aryan. Um, the Vandals was another big barbarian kingdom. They were Aryans. And the Eastern Goths, which were in Rome, they were Aryans. And so after the Council of Nicaea, it became interesting. On the one hand, Constantine wants to Christianize the uh, Roman Empire. So, yeah, all these savages, Goths, Vandals, you know, that's what we have vandalism from, right? Now they become Christians, they become civilized. Vandals settle in Carthage, that's the place where Tertullian and many other church father, fathers actually lived. But these Vandals and Goths, now heretics. So the Western Roman Empire is all full of heretics, whereas the Constantinople is the law of the land that's right. Well, as you can see, Nicene Creed seems to be all right, but boy, it is complicated. This is one of the earliest uh, papyri with the record of it. And so, we believe in God, in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and one in, uh, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, only the, the only begotten, that is the essence of the Father, God of God, uh, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being, uh, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, both in heaven and on earth. Man, it's complicated, right? And so I was trying to fit a Nicene Creed in one slide. No, it fit in three slides. It's long. It's complex. It, in, in its original Greek, 
It has so many technicalities. And again, no reference to the Scripture whatsoever. Whatsoever. The Scripture is clear. Instead of this una substantia tres personae by Tertullian, Deuteronomy 6.4, spells out the prayer which actually Jesus in Mark chapter 12 calls the first commandment of the Bible. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Very simple biblical truth. Compare this short line with this, this, this. Okay? Hear what Paul talks. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in flesh, justified in spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed in the world, received up in glory. Very simple. God was manifested in flesh. Whom is Paul talking about? So very simple. No, this flowery philosophical discourses, simple, you know, what, uh, six words in English. God was manifested in flesh. And if you take a look at what else Paul says, do you not know that you are the temple of God? and Holy Spirit dwells in you? You see what's written here? We are the temple of God, and in us lives who? Not the power, not the energy, but the Holy Spirit. I mean, I'm not trying to present to you the full uh, Proofs, which is plenty, and there, are, there is Isaiah, there is Peter, there is Jesus himself who says, I and the Father is one. They're so simple from the Bible. But if you think that Nicene Creed is cumbersome, look at what it Continues because Nicene Creed was not the end of all these philosophical discussions. Later was Chalcedonian, later was uh, uh, Ephesian councils, and in every single, you know, uh, this period which precedes the dark ages of the church. In, church, in classical church history is called the period of church councils. They were holding the councils and most important question on these councils was to understand the nature of God. Eventually, be my guest to read that. Athanasius. That's almost the final creed about the nature of God. Look at what it begins with. Whosoever will be saved before all things it's necessary that he hold the Catholic faith. Uh, there's no yet a Catholic church in the sense as we understand it today. Catholic means, the original Catholic means worldwide. So, but, this is preamble. If you want to be saved, you have to believe our faith. 
And of course, here, Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity, Trinity in union, neither confound in the persons, not divide in essence. Be my guest. One page. Sec two, three, four, five. It is worse. That's the la No, that's not the last one. That's not the last one. <laughs> I copied this Athanasian Creed specifically to show how sophisticated. And, and do you see and there is no single reference to the Bible? It's all kind of, you know what it looks like? It looks like a small print when you get your insurance agreement. <laughs> this is, you know, if you read any kind of insurance agreement or banking card agreement, this is exactly this. They go through every detail, you know, what, what this small print is doing is this. The this, this small print attempts to protect the card issuer or insurance uh, provider from being sued. And so they try to foresee every possible occurrence or occasion. And here they're addressing every single possible heresy. And in fighting the heresy, this gentleman, Athanasius, completely forgot that there is a Bible and God's revelation. And so on and on and on he goes. That's the last page. If while I was speaking, you can imagine I was tempted to read all of this. If I was to read all of this, we would be sitting here until 10 o'clock. <laughs> And you would scratch your head trying to understand it. Because if you ask me if I understand this with my PhD, no, I don't. Because there has to be a church historian and systematician, theologian, to really understand all this needy, greedy, small print in the doctrine of Trinity, which was the official Catholic doctrine with which... Emperor Justinian went for war for the unification of the Roman Empire. It happens in 520. A famous Aryan Wars. The Aryan Wars predicted by Prophet Daniel. Prophet Daniel, who saw in his vision in chapter 7, a little horn that grows in the, from the head of the terrible beast. That terrible beast represents Roman Empire. And something is growing out of this Roman Empire. And this Roman, not only this little horn, there are other, actually there are ten horns. Okay? And when this little horn is growing out of empire, uh, of, uh, 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 out of among these ten horns, he destroys the three horns. It is very interesting that as we talked, there were three big Aryan kingdoms which prevented Roman Empire to be reunified. The former barbarians, East Goths, West Goths, and Vandals. And look at what happens. The uh, prophet receives explanation that these ten horns are the ten kings, and there is one which will arise and subdue the three. And after he subdues the three, he speaks pompous words against the Most High and begins to persecute the saints of the Most High and will attempt to change times, 
and the law. You see where it begins? Let's fight the heresies on a level of the state. And where we come to? We come to the dark period in Christianity where the state begins to fight. Anyone who holds a different belief rather than an established faith is a, rather than Catholic faith, again, we're in the old terminology, so it's not related to today's Catholic, but back then, the Catholic faith, the Catholic faith back then, as we read in preamble to the Athanas Athanasian Creed, was the faith which was voted on the church councils. You see, this is how it works. So the, the, the three Aryan kingdoms need to be destroyed because they did not accept the will of the church councils. And that's why Justinian goes to war. War which, has, which is first time in history, Christian history, has theological pretext. They understand God differently. They are the heretics. Well, well, it's not easy to understand the nature of God. The book of Deuteronomy says, the secret things belongs to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us. Look at what we've been talking all this time. Revealed, concealed. That's the Jewish faith. This is how God taught Moses the Jewish faith. Revealed, concealed. Whatever is revealed, we know. It's in Scripture. It's plain, it's simple. Whatever is concealed, let us not get into. Otherwise, we cannot call ourselves believers if we don't believe the revelation. If we want to see and reason it out, this is no longer a faith. And that's the whole underlying reason why Christianity plunged into the dark period. Just because they refused to believe. They refused to accept that there is something about the nature of God which is not possible to comprehend by sinful human mind. And that's why Jesus says, have a faith like children. Children, a young children, are not really capable to comprehend their parents. But they trust the parents. We have our Heavenly Father who wants us to trust him rather than comprehend him. Amen? Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to learn from your word. Help us to trust whatever you reveal because your thoughts are not our thoughts. We cannot penetrate your infinite mind. We're sinners. And only thing we need is your redemption through the blood of your son, Jesus, who is King of kings, the Lord of lords. And all we need is a constant presence of the Holy Spirit, who is God, 
living with, within us, helping us to maintain our connection with you, our Creator, Redeemer, and Father. Amen.